Hello everyone and welcome to the February edition of Grafton Minute by Minute, a magazine that features events that take place right here in the town of Grafton. I'm Bob DeToma. We'll start off this episode with a conversation I had recently with Grafton's own Mary Romanis and the topic is autism. My guest in studio is Mary Romanis and she is a local author and she has written two books? One book officially. One book officially, anyway. Um, and that book happens to be on the topic of autism. So welcome. Thank you. Um, as we were talking about before we turned on the cameras, I was trying to think of uh, questions that dealt with autism and then you come, you come to realize that we don't really know a lot about the topic. No. It's, it's amazing what the general public perceives about autism. Mm. And it's also amazing, even within the autism community, how there are different factions of philosophy, perspectives, whatever you want to call it, but that's what happens within the autism community. So I actually, when I wrote the book, I took it from the perspective of what's happening to the parent as they go through this process of trying to, not just to heal their child, but to heal the family. Mm. Because I found that that just was not being addressed, and yet there were universal themes, no matter what our perspective was on what autism is, or how to treat autism, or even if you do treat autism. Mm. I found that we did have some similarities that I felt needed to be addressed, and that's why I wrote the book. Mm. So let me get some of the simple stuff out of the way. Yeah. Did you wake up one day and decide, I need to write a book? Or were there people in your life who said, Mary, write a book, Mary, write a book? <laughs> so, you know, like, which path was it? It was actually both. Okay. So um, I have been writing over the past, oh gosh, probably 12 years. One of the articles that I wrote, I actually got approached by um, a, a large parenting magazine, and they said, we heard that your child has recovered from autism, and so that's another one of the myths. People right. don't realize it is happening. Um, autism is treatable, and kids are recovering. And we're going to talk about what recovery is versus cure. They're not the same. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so they heard about this through another leading autism organization, and they asked me to write the story. And I says, okay, I really don't care. I'll write it. So I just went blah, 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 and um, it's probably too long for you guys, but here you go. And not only did they love it, but they wanted more. So they asked for extra information. They asked for sidebars. They, they really were going to make this a larger story than what I thought it was going to be. So it ended up being like two, you know, 2,500, 3,000 words, which is large. It's, mm. a, it's a magazine. So I send it off, and the article comes out, and it is an instant firestorm in the community. So back then, what was really popular was Yahoo Groups, and we were sending that article, not me, but it was being sent around throughout the country. Mm. I started to receive emails, phone calls. Um, I got asked to participate in radio discussions. So that particular article ended up winning the magazine like a Peabody Award for service. So that sort of started the, the influx of me writing. I got approached by an autism magazine finally after that, and I sat down with her, and I just sort of like, I don't know, the editor and I were sort of convincing about the topics that are relevant in our community. There was mm. marriage issues. There was a sibling issues. There was how do you handle the school district. There was a whole bunch of things. And so as I, we were talking at lunch, she says, you know, you have a different perspective. I think I want to go ahead and interview you, or actually have you write for, the, for this particular magazine. So that's what happened next. Right. So I started to write, and then other magazines would reach out and ask me to write various things. It, right. was, it was not even a thought that I was becoming a writer mm. for magazines or making this a profession. Mm. It just happened because the need was there. So, so we're all aware that you work for the Grafton News and we've right. seen you at events. Yep. And probably everybody thinks of you as Mary the writer or Mary the reporter. <laughs> yeah. And so at one point in your life, you were not a writer. I was a public relations person. So okay. anytime you're in public relations, you're always a writer. Okay. So people don't realize that public relations people, they put out press releases, mm -hmm. they understand the genres that they have to write for, there's different writing styles. So yes, I was a writer by background, okay. Okay. Uh, but, my, but when I was working, I wasn't per se a writer, mm. I was a buyer. Mm. Okay, so now you've kind of narrowed the focus, Yes, so to speak. by default. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, and then, so your experiences at home also helped you down the path yeah, to this topic. Exactly, and, and thank you for saying that. But yes, my experience is at home. And the reason why I say that is because every time I went through something, and what, no matter what the topic was, I would end up on the other end of this horrible ordeal and say, oh gosh, I guess I've got to write about this now. 
Mm. So, and that's what kept happening. I remember I landed in the hospital twice in the same year due to stress-related heart condition brought on by the idea that I had to do all and be all, to, not only to help my son, but to help the rest of everybody else. Mm. And I felt this compulsion. So as I went through this horrible ordeal, I realized at the end of it, I've got to write about this. Mm. Now, it may have taken a couple of years before I was able to write about it, but everything I've ever gone through has ended up in writing at some point. Mm. Fascinating. So when you started to write the book, was the goal to find answers or to um, help you personally deal with the topic or to help others or all of the above? That's interesting you should ask that. It, it was none of that from the perspective of I actually wrote the book because there was this in, innate compulsion that the information was not out there. Mm. I was frustrated at the myths that were being put out by the media, put out by others, A, that autism was not treatable when I know for a fact, based upon our experiences, that it is treatable. Mm. Kids are recovering. Families are healing. I was also frustrated at even the myths within our community, such as there's a 90% divorce rate, and I didn't see that. I was mentoring families, counseling them, if you will, and I didn't see our families divorcing, but I saw 100% of them going through hell, and I knew why. Mm. They were going through a grief cycle, which I figured the pattern out. There was six stages of grief once your child has been diagnosed. So I started getting, as I said, I was frustrated, and I started to take a lot of the writings that I've done before and sort of expand upon it. And then I added other topics that I thought were not being addressed, like the typical siblings. They, they are part of this autism epidemic, too, because it affects their entire lives. Mm. So who are they? How are their needs being addressed? So I, not only did I talk about the marriage issues, but I talked about the care for the caregiver. How do you take care of the, of the caregiver so that that caregiver is in this for the long haul? And that the needs of each individual is being addressed so that they stay together as a family and they thrive together as a family. So all of these components were not being addressed. So not only was I bringing it to light that, th that this happens or that these are issues we need to address, but I was also showing practical steps as to how do you individually and as a family get through it. Mm. So let me show you what we did. And it was small, doable steps. And I found that if you broke it down, the individuals could feel like I could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I chose to do with this book. Hmm. Interesting. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you was how many times have well-meaning people said things that have just set you off? Oh. <laughs> I, I, you know, there's, there, so they're, I trying, had a they're trying to show they care, but it just didn't come out right. Well, it, it still happens. Okay. And, and, and I've had to try to learn to be pragmatic about the only thing that can still drive me over the edge was well, your child must not have been diagnosed correctly in the first place to have recut because you don't get cured from autism. And I says, I never said the word cured. The word I used is recovery. Mm. And the difference between recovery and cured is like the difference between somebody who's actually cured of cancer and then somebody who's an alcoholic, but they're in, always in perpetual recovery. Sure. You know, so you've got that component. So with a recovered child with autism, so he no longer has the symptoms. However, he, we have to monitor his immune system and his diet and ensure that he stays on this path of continuing to monitor his own health as he gets into his adult years. Mm. So, but for all intents and purposes, this is a child who was destined for a group home. And that's what the doctors told us. Something would be down the road, he would be in a group home, but instead we're planning college. So there's a recovery there. This is a child who had 27 hours a week of services and now he has none. This is a child we didn't think could speak and now he won't shut up. This is a child who at one time we begged, would you please just be typical and now he's grounded, you know? So mm. <laughs> how typical do you want to be? Right. So the point is, is that um, I think parents need to know, A, that this is possible. Don't believe the myths out there. Please don't think of this as the end of the world because you're just beginning a different journey than what you thought you were choosing. Mm. All right, so now I've, now you've triggered two other additional questions, which is the whole idea around this program. Exactly. <laughs> As your son ages, mm -hmm. the recovery continuously improves. 
Yes or no? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. And as your son ages, is the potential out there for something to trigger this or to go, he will never to go back fall to back? autism. Okay. However, he is susceptible to mental health and autoimmune disorders. Okay. And that's just sort of the the conundrum that people don't realize that you always are having to monitor this through diet, through supplements, or whatever it is that you're doing to maintain your health. Just mm. we all do. Mm. Okay, so it's it isn't that he's going to go back to autism because that won't happen, but he he could go into something else, mm. and that is because of the the gut issues, the immune system issues, how it's all related to the psychological immune system issues. There's I mean there's a um, the brain issues. So uh, whether it's a, a neurological disorder, psychological disorder, mental health disorder, one of those things, it's all related to how he maintains his immune system. Hmm. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. I talk about it actually in the book as to how the age of insult to the immune system determines actually what you get. So there's a whole lot of science that's behind this, and I understand that. It's a little bit overwhelming for the general public to hear that for the first time. Mm. What, you mean you're not just genetically predisposed and it just shows up? Well, there's a lot of triggers that could potentially be setting that off. Mm. And some of the issues, I mean, as far as I think I understand, are um, light, sound, smell? As far as the sensitivities? Sure. Yes, and he had all of those. Okay. Uh, he had. But he had a whole host of other ones, and each child is different, mm. whatever their sensitivities are. So he had sensory issues, he had low muscle tone, he had no speech for a period of time. Uh, low muscle tone? Yeah, low muscle tone is part of it as well. It's called hypotonia. Interesting. Yeah, so a lot of our kids have got problems with fine motor and gross motor. They have a hard time sitting up because they've got this low muscle tone. So they're put into therapies in order to be able to even sit at a desk. Interesting. Yeah, so he had that. Sensory issues where they're sensitive to even textures, sounds. To, uh, they don't like people touching them, some oh, that's people? Some right, people, right. yeah, he wasn't like that. But mm. he was one of those, like the tag on his shirt, throw him crazy, certain. Well, that, cer that drives me crazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but also like the weight of certain clothes was bothering him. Mm. Some kids don't like socks. And we have kids that are having to, even here in Grafton, that go to school wearing sandals in the middle of winter because they can't stand the idea that they're wearing socks. Interesting. So you, you just you just never know wow. what, how the kids are going to respond. That is absolutely amazing. But the, but the remedies, however, are somewhat universal and it starts with diet. Yeah. And I tell this to everybody, you're, if you want to have any kind of healing, no matter what you have going on in your life, whether you have a child with autism, sensory processing disorder, ADD, ADHD, or you as an adult have got something going on, the moment you start changing your diet, you start to see that you're going to be pulling the thread to getting well. Mm. And it starts even with autism. You start changing the diet, you start pulling the thread to finding the answers that lead to possibly a child getting well. Mm. One of the things I remember, uh, we had been exchanging messages back and forth before you came in, and one of the phrases you used was your son had been injured. Yeah. I don't remember the exact phrase, but I remember that was one of the words. Mm -hmm. What was the exact phrase you Vaccine used? Vaccine injured. Vaccine injured. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, there's a big controversy because everybody says, you know, with, no, vaccines don't cause autism. How dare you say vaccines cause autism? Well, I'm not going to tell you that vaccines cause autism, but I'm going to tell you that my child was vaccine injured. In what way? Uh, it created this holistic breakdown first in his gastrointestinals, which we have this all quantified. This is not anything I'm just sort of like speculating. Mm -hmm. This was, he's actually medically exempt from all further vaccines because it destroyed his immune system. So while we have that whole cascade that happened to him, we have a genetic predisposition, which we discovered later. Um, he was also affected in utero by the flu vaccine I got while pregnant. Mm -hmm. Now, I have immune system issues. I don't detox well, so any of the toxins that were potentially in that vaccine may have affected him in utero, and he was born with birth defects. Mm -hmm. And he also had issues with, again, the hypotonia, the sensory issues. He had that at birth. Well, those are all symptoms of mercury poisoning. Mercury was in the vaccine that I received. So they were giving this to pregnant women. So. Anyways, I'm not I'm not bashing vaccines. I I, right, I, right. I think everybody has that right as a parent to make that choice, informed choice, mm. which is what I would like to encourage. Mm. So I wish that there were things that I had known and had done differently because I'm on the receiving end of having to pay the price. Right. So whatever price parents think that they're going to be paying between either choosing to or not choosing to, completely up to them. But 
afterwards, once we did the research, not just on how it affected him, but the genetic predisposition, we as a family had to start making different choices, not just with choosing to not further vaccinate, but also to change our diets, change out some of the supplements we were doing. There was just a lot of whole host of things that we realized we needed to get a handle on to have a longer term better health. Mm. Even I know that mercury is toxic. How mm -hmm. many medications today still have mercury in them? Well, uh, all the, most of your flu vaccines, so there was 25 micrograms in the flu vaccine that I received. So which was, so they were giving that also to children. So that's, you look at that. Um, it's in a lot of different, different things, both natural and unnatural, mm. but it is out there. And it's still in, and I know people think that it's been taken out of all pediatric vaccines. The problem is though, is that the process to making them, it, they're still getting cross contaminated because the process itself, there are trace amounts. Wow. And so in some kids predisposed, could be reacting to that. And boom. Exactly. Wow. So That's interesting. Uh, you as an adult, if you go to get a tetanus vaccine, it's, it's got mercury in it. Mm. So I, again, I'm not disputing what anybody else chooses mm. to do. I, I don't, that's not my bandwagon. Mm. So one of the things we had chatted about on, uh, online was that people mistake your sons um, no longer having, no longer taking vaccines. People have twisted that into you're an advocate for nobody taking vaccines, period. Right. And it's not the case, it's just in your exactly. son's particular... Exactly. It's, okay. it's our story. Hmm. And I believe anybody's story. So if you come to me and you tell me my kid just had this at birth, okay, I completely believe you because we're starting to see that rise of kids hmm. really having issues right at birth. But it's, and you have to ask yourself, what is the toxic load going on into the mothers? So what are the environmental triggers that are being present here during pregnancy? I mean, we're seeing this right now with what they think is the Zika virus and you're starting to see whatever is... It, there's a lot of speculation out there uh, whether or not it is a virus or was it an environmental trigger. We don't know. Mm. So th you have to ask yourself what's happening during pregnancy that's possibly mothers are coming in with a toxic load. Who knows? Who knows what's mm. going on that might be affecting the children is with the escalating levels. It's not just autism. We have a lot of issues with kids with allergies, with asthma, diabetes. Mm -hmm childhood cancers. So it's, it's, while it's always been there to some degree, it's not been there at the levels that we see today. Mm. And that's what our community has been sounding the alarm about. Look, our, our kids with the autism, we're the canaries. Mm. It's as you get older that you're starting to see this upsurge. And now you're starting to see an upsurge in teenage mental health disorders. Mm. And what we're finding is that the immune system gets triggered at that time and you have something that's possibly strep related and it's causing what is known as a brain infection, known as PANDAS, which stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Strep. It is so rampant that they actually had a conference in Providence, Rhode Island in 2014. 5,000 people showed up for this thing because of how many kids today are affected with that, including wow. kids here in Grafton. It's amazing. Yeah, these kids could be fine one day and the next day they're Boom. having a psychotic breakdown and they're yeah. ending up in a mental health ward and the doctors are giving them psych meds and it may not necessarily be that they need the psych meds. They need to have possibly an antibiotic to address an underlying infection or they need to have immunoglobulin therapy because their whole immune system is broken down. We don't know, mm. but, it's, but it's out there. That's amazing. So one of the things that you mentioned also before we went on the air was um, high functioning versus low functioning. Um, and this might sound like an odd question, but I'll ask it anyway. How many, how many high, no, let me find another way to word this. How many famous high functioning people are there out there? Do we know of any? Oh, there's plenty. Okay. There's plenty of high functioning. These are people that can get through life and are, are highly skilled, highly gifted, can make decisions, can have normal functioning relationships. Right. But they have quirks or oddities, and some of those oddities might be considered gifts. But right? are they using their experience to promote the issue? No. They're not? No, well, there are some. There are some definitely who are out there as high functioning adults, and they believe, not all, mm -hmm. but there is a movement out there that believes that they speak for everybody diagnosed right, right. with autism, even if they're severe. And they think that the parents are the ones that are in the way. 
And that's been a huge divide in our community because the parents are the ones that are going to be shouldering the burden as these more severely affected individuals you know, become adults. Mm. And they get into their senior years and they're, and they're thinking, what's going to happen when I die? What's going to happen to my child? Sure. You know, so that's a real conundrum. And we're, we're really in a, um, we're in for it. We're bracing ourselves because the tsunami of the adults hitting the system now um, is, is at our doorstep. Mm. Wow. So let's um, okay. announce the title of your book. Okay, so, the, okay. Hold, yeah, hold it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's titled Victory Over Autism, written by Mary Romanis. And uh, I'm assuming it's available everywhere? I think so. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> there's a whole story there. <laughs> yeah, so th this, um, it's published by Skyhorse. Okay. And it's on Amazon for sure, Barnes and Noble. Well, there you go. If it's on Amazon, you don't it's have to worry. Exactly. So. Exactly. It's out there. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm just hoping that it gets into the hands of those that feel like it, it could benefit them, right. or they know somebody, yeah. and perhaps they just want to become a little more articulate on the issue. If right. they have a family member, I have a wonderful physician that wrote the forward to the book. Her name is Dr. Andrea Usman. She's based out of Chicago. She's well known in our community. One, uh, just just a bright light. Mm. And so she graced me with the opportunity to write the, mm. the forward to the book, too. And you still welcome contact from folks? I do. And how I would do. you like them to contact you? Well, I have a website, which is maryromanis.com, and they can go there. My contact information is there. I think that would be a good idea. Okay. That way they can... We'll, we'll put that at the bottom of the screen yeah, magically, <laughs> so we don't have to worry about spelling it. Yeah. It'll be right there. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I learned a lot. Our friend Beth Galloway from the Grafton Public Library is back with another Library Minute. Hi, I'm Beth Galloway, director of the Grafton Public Library, here with a Library Minute. We have a fabulous lineup of February Vacation Week programs, kicking off with Mr. Kim on Friday, February 12th at 10 a.m. Now, pre-registration is required, but if you miss this month, he'll be here the second Friday of March as well. So just give the library a call at 508-839. 4649 extension 1103 to sign up. We will be closed on February 15th for President's Day. Our Daytimers book group meets at 1.30 on the 16th and then we have family movie night also on Tuesday with Frozen starting at 6.30 p.m. Lego Day is all day starting at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, February 17th. Come down to the children's room and we'll have Duplos for the little ones and full-size Legos for our school-age friends. We have a tween crafter noon, a DIY Sharpie mug project in the afternoon, and our Grafton Writers Group meet, meets in the evening. On Thursday the 18th, come on down to grab a hammer and build a wooden truck. And our teens will be hosting a popcorn taste test in the afternoon. Friday is Frozen Fever Day. Come and make your own Olaf stuffed snowman. You have to bring your own white sock. And we'll be running the Frozen Fever film twice during the day with a special appearance from Queen Elsa at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Our Vacation Week programs wrap up with a special All Ages Seasonal Story Time on Saturday, February 20th. We have a lot of other wonderful events going on, so please do visit our library website at graftonlibrary.org and click on the events calendar for the full listing. This has been Beth Galloway, Library Director with a Library Minute. Jenny Anderson from the Grafton Rec Department was in studio recently with an update to their community calendar and recreation department activities. Hi everyone, I'm in studio and my guest is Jenny Anderson from the Grafton Recreation Department and she has some updates to your community calendar pertaining to, as I said, the rec department. Yes. That's your moment to shine. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we're here to launch, uh, tell you about all of our new spring and summer programming. Um, registration is now open for all of our spring and summer stuff, and, and there's early registration discounts for a couple different programs, mainly our summer youth program by April 1st. So we're here to tell you to take a look head to graftonrec.com. You'll see a list of all of our programs. We also do have a brochure in print and available on the website. Um, to pick one up, you can stop by the Recreation Department office. Uh, if you want to call us, we'll mail one to you. Um, we're also going to be putting these out 
um, in the in the town hall and hope the library and stuff so you guys um, can pick these up as well. Uh, so we just want to highlight some of the programs that are coming up. Uh, mainly this spring, uh, we have a couple of vacation week programs um, for both February and April. Uh, the April ones, we just added a new soccer clinic program. So along with our popular outdoor adventure program, the horseback riding lesson program, we also have a soccer clinic for the week of April vacation. Um, for the summer programming, a couple highlights. We have some new programs, including a watercolor workshop, a home alone safety course, um, the babysitting certification course is coming back um, for two different dates. Uh, and then we have um, our summer events and, and concerts returning. So the concerts of the common will be happening starting July 13th and running through August. Um, we're also working with the Mill Villages Committee uh, to form a Movies in the Park. We're hopefully going to launch um, at least three different nights, Friday nights in the summer with uh, movie nights. So that's going to be great. Stay tuned for that. Uh, some of the special events that are coming up, the earliest one would be the road race. It's the 27th annual road race in May, uh, May 7th, and registration is open for that right now. And then coming up in June, um, the big truck day will return. Um, the beach will be opening up at the end of June, and the doggy dip days uh, will have those as well. Um, beach passes for Silver Lake are also available uh, online and in the rec office, so you can pick those up and be ready for opening day on June 19th. Uh, and then we'll lead all the way to the, to the fall. The farmer's market will be back um, as well and um, carry us through October um, for that. But um, one of the things we also have going on that we started last year in conjunction with the library is Stories in the Park. So every Friday during the summer, uh, the library is going to be hosting a read-along and a, you know, picnic-type lunch at a bunch of different parks around town. Um, and two different dates at Silver Lake Beach. Um, those are all available um, for you to look at the locations online as well. Um, and then we're excited to um, kind of re-debut our summer youth program. It's, it's under new management, there's new staff, a new layout, uh, and new pricing, as I said. And the new pricing um, also includes an early registration discount by April 1st. So that's really important uh, so you don't lose out on your spot. Um, details about a like an activity schedule for the day and um, some new policies and procedures are available on our website as well. So just make sure that you're visiting graftandrec.com often as we're updating things constantly and to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Graft and Rec Department for updates. I think that's my highlights for the, the point it, uh, we are at right now, but as, the, as I said, Registration is open now for all our spring and summer programs. If you have any questions, any feedback, any concerns or comments, please reach out to us um, at uh, graftandrec.com. You'll find our phone number and our email, um, and, or stop by the office and say hi. Well, thank you. Wow, you, you took away all the information. The only thing I have left to say is, what's the phone number? 508-839-5335, uh, extension 1156. So there it is. A lot of stuff going on at the Graft and Rec Department. Thanks to Jenny, and thank you for watching. And that wraps up the February edition of Grafton Minute by Minute. I hope you'll come back and join us in March. I'm Bob Datoma. For everyone here at Grafton Community Television, thank you for watching, and good night.